Okay, this is the breaker plexus blocks when, where, and why lecture. Let's get started. Hopefully, by the end of the lecture, you will have a very good understanding of the relevant anatomy. You will know when, where, and why to do the block for each patient. And you will cover all the knowledge you need for your exam. In case you're doing your board exam, ITE, any kind of exam. So as usual, we'll start with some relevant anatomy here. So <clears throat> what I want you to see in this short clip, paying attention to the relation between the lung, the first rib, the clavicle, and the brachial plexus. So now I'm just rotating. See how the brachial plexus is coming above the first strip. The first strip is really your friend and your safety point to avoid going to the lung. And see here how the relation between the plexus going above the first strip underneath the clavicle. Also, if you notice at this level here, when, when we start to talk about the infra clavicular block, see how far we are from the lung. While in this clip, you see this is the platysma. I'm removing the platysma. And here I'm removing the superficial uh, cervical plexus block. This is the external jugular vein, also removing it. And then here the sternocleidomastoid with the two heads, also removing them. So underneath that, you will see the major vessels. And just with rotation, you will see the anterior scalene muscle, the middle scalene muscle, and in between them, you see the brachial plexus. So if we would remove the anterior scalene here and pay attention to the muscle behind that, it's another important muscle, just let me give you some rotation here. That's the longus coli muscle. And see its relation to the common carotid and um, the internal jugular. And this is the omohyoid with its two heads, right? So um, the sternocleidomastoid form the anterior border of the posterior triangle of the neck. And that's what we are interested on for the purpose of this lecture, the posterior triangle of the neck, which is farther divided by, by the omohyoid into occipital triangle and subclavicular triangle. Here you will see the recurrent uh, uh, laryngeal nerve, which will be relevant when we talk about one of the potential side effects of uh, certain uh, uh, blocks. See how it's in the groove between the trachea and esophagus. And in the other uh, picture here, you see the, the, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the thyroid. Pay more attention to the cricoid cartilage. So cricoid cartilage roughly around C6, which another important landmark when we talk about all these blocks in this lecture. See the upper pool of the uh, thyroid almost um, at C5, but you know, this is variable. Um, here, where I want you to pay attention is to the autonomic system in the neck, um, mainly the sympathetic system. So here we have the superior cervical ganglion. It's a, it's a big ganglion, has some uh, you know, implications sometimes with headache. That's another lecture. And here we have the middle cervical ganglion. And here our famous stellate ganglion or the cervicothoracic ganglion. So all these ganglions in the facial plane above the longus coli muscle. Important to remember that. Now, if we take an imaginary line between the cricoid cartilage and cut back, we will end up around C6, as I told you in the previous slide. But notice how at that level where we usually do the interscaling block to get you know, the C5, uh, C6 root, note that uh, where is the middle cervical ganglion. So the middle cervical ganglion, as I told you, it's, it's a sympathetic 
innervation for the head and neck and it's above the longus coli muscle covered by the prevertebral fascia so if we start to look at uh, some ultrasound images here uh, not surprising this is the, the carotid and behind the carotid this is the thi thyroid you will see the middle cervical ganglion uh, here is uh, another view and here is a longitudinal view the clinical relevance here that if you end up blocking this ganglion then you might get something called Horner syndrome which we'll talk about in a minute now this is the precal plexus which is uh, we we really want to know it by heart if we know if we want to know master these blocks so it originate from C5 C6 C7 C8 all the way to T9 so this is obviously T sorry T1 with the first strip and this is C7 this is 6 and this is 5 now the first couple of roots so here at this level we call them root then root give you trunks then trunks give you division then division give you cores and cores give you the terminal branches so the c5 and c6 nerve root they come together to form the superior trunk the c7 continue as the middle trunk c8 and t1 uh, form the inferior trunk now if we keep an eye here towards branches of C5 uh, even before they form the superior trunk you have the dorsal scapular nerve and branch to a phrenic nerve and some other nerves less important again for the purpose of this lecture when we look at the superior trunk we have the very important supra scapular nerve it branch off the superior trunk the lateral border of the superior trunk and we have the subclavian nerve and when these uh, uh, um, the posterior uh, division so uh, again the, the each trunk give you anterior and posterior division anterior and posterior division each trunk so the posterior division of all three trunks form the posterior cord so that's the posterior cord came from all posterior division from the three trunk and then the anterior division of the superior and middle trunk form the lateral cord and the medial cord is the anterior division of the inferior trunk so the lateral cord give you the uh, lateral pectoral nerve the posterior cord here give you the upper subscapular nerve, thoracodorsal, and lower scapular nerve. The, the, the medial cord give you the medial pectoral nerve, medial branch cutaneous nerve, and medial anti-brachial cutaneous nerve. And you see when we go to the terminal branches, you get the musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar. Now, Another important landmark here is the lateral border of pectoralis minor that attach into the coracoid process. So after that point, we start to get the peripheral nerves. The branches of the lateral and medial cords are all ventral nerve to upper extremity. The posterior cord provides all dorsal innervation to the upper extremity. Now, these cords are named according to their relationship to the second part of the axillary artery. So, behind the axillary artery, posterior, lateral to axillary card, uh, artery, uh, uh, lateral cord, and medial to the axillary artery, the medial cord. And notice what happened. The, the superior trunk, the superior trunk, now become the lateral cord. The middle trunk goes behind the artery now becomes the posterior cord the inferior trunk now become the medial cord it's very important to keep this in mind 
Okay, another important nerve here is the intercostal brachial nerve, which is a branch from T2, and it supply this inner part, which is often missed when we do brachial plexus block, basically because it's coming from T2, right? Now, another two important nerve is the dorsoscapular nerve, which form from C5 root of the brachial plexus, and the, the lung thoracic nerve, which form from the anterior rami of C5 to C7. The dorsoscapular nerve pass posterior. Uh, often, uh, you know, uh, if, if you look here, that's the, that's the anterior scalene, this is the middle scalene. So it pass posterior uh, between the middle scalene and take uh, and uh, the the back turn uh, and it run along the medial border of the scapula and it innervate the rhomboid major and major muscle from their deep surface while the lung thoracic nerve pass vertically down to the uh, down the neck through the axillary inlet and down the medial wall of the axilla to supply the serratus anterior and lies on the superficial aspect of the serratus anterior muscle. So if we look here, that's your dorsal scapular nerve, and that's your long thoracic nerve. They are inside the uh, uh, middle scalene at this level, and you can see the brachial plexus here. Now, another important nerve is the supraclavicular nerve. The supraclavicular nerve is a branch from the superficial cervical plexus and usually give cutaneous innervation to, to this area here. So the supraclavicular nerve give you three branches. The lateral branch usually run uh, uh, with the trapezius muscle, the intermediate branch, and the medial branch. And the, sup, uh, the, 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 the supraclavicular nerve is one of the four branches of the superficial uh, uh, cervical plexus, which give you the lesser occipital here, the greater occipital here, the transverse cervical, and I showed you the uh, supraclavicular uh, branches. More important nerve, we have the phrenic nerve. We have to know the course of the nerve and the vagus nerve. Now, if you notice here, the phrenic nerve, I highlighted it in uh, pink, it's running, it came between the anterior and middle scalene, right? Remember, it's, it's uh, close to C5 there, it's coming above. And then it takes that turn and go anterior to the anterior scalene. Well, if you notice the vagus nerve, here, it's like straight anterior to the anterior uh, scalene. This is, again, the course of the dorsal scapula. Now, here, as you imagine, and as you see, the vagus nerve is like straight and running with the major vessels of the neck. So, uh, in this image, I remove the sternocleidomastoid just and turn it just to show you, again, the phrenic and, and vagus nerve. So the phrenic nerve, if we have a cut at this level here, high up, so it's basically, as you see, it's anterior to the anterior scalene muscle, very close to uh, C5. That makes sense when you block the interscalene, you most likely, and in some references, almost 100%, you will block that nerve. If we slightly, uh, this is another, again, um, same cut. If we slightly go down here, still at the interscalene level. You, the more you go down, the more you chase the nerve going more anterior and anterior, and again, anterior to the uh, anterior scalene muscle and between the sternocleidomastoid. If we go more down here at the superior trunk level, so you see the superior trunk level here, you notice the nerve start to go more anterior going away. And if you go even lower here, still superior trunk is going away. So make sure you find this nerve regardless what nerve block you're doing. Now, 
The Vegas NER, interestingly, there is a lot of variability where it locates, but it usually in the area between, you know, the common carotid and internal jugular vein. So here in position number one, you find it between the common carotid and internal jugular, just at the posterior side, just behind them. Here, just anterior, and here anterior between them, here uh, between the carotid and the trachea, and here behind the carotid, and again behind the carotid. So there is a lot of variability. So it's important to keep in mind that. Now, let's uh, uh, jump in and talk about how we do these blocks. So uh, preparation, positioning, very important. So the first thing we need to have, we have to have an IV, functioning IV, in foil monitors, EKG, non-invasive blood pressure, pulse ox. Then position is the key. The most challenging cases I've seen um, or the related, honestly, to position. So the ideal position will be uh, put the patient either on a semi-sitting position where the head always should be uh, turned to the other side. You can put that in a pillow in a certain way. I will show you a few pictures here. Or uh, even put the patient in a lateral position and put a pillow or blanket, whatever support or pump that shoulder in. Um, so, for example, this, this is not a good blanket here in your way. This is, this is a better image here. But for organization, you are standing on the ipsilateral side and putting the, the, the ultrasound uh, in front of you, uh, and that will help you to better visualize. And for a single shot, you need a hat and a mask and a sterile gloves, um, of course, under uh, aseptic technique. If you are putting a catheter, you need a gown. And obviously, if you're putting a peripheral nerve stimulator, also you need a gown. Um, for, for the needle, you can use 50 to 100 millimeter, 22 gauge, based on your preference. I usually use 50 for the interscaling, and I, I can use 100 for infraclavicular, supraclavicular. Again, but it depends on the patient, obese, not obese, etc. So let's talk about the interscaling preclamp plexus block. So by definition, it's an injection at C5 and C6 nerve root between the anterior and middle scalene muscle in the interscaling group, roughly around C6. So it's a root level uh, uh, injection, as you see here and here, and it cover uh, uh, C5 and C6 mainly. Of course, some uh, many of the time, some medication goes to C7 as well. Now, um, so that's the interscaling groove um, where we eventually like to have our medication on. And that's the area that this block cover. So notice, um, uh, you know, um, part of the neck here, you know, uh, and the arm, it always and mostly miss that uh, inferior uh, trunk, right? Uh, which is not necessarily for shoulder surgery. Uh, so the indication, it's best for shoulder and proximal arm procedure, as well as scapula and clavicle. There are more recent, newer uh, uh, blocks for clavicle in, in my YouTube channel. It frequently spares the ulnar nerve, which makes sense. It's usually missed the lower plexus root, and therefore it's not an advocated surgery for arm or forearm, unless you supplement it with something else, which we're going to cover. Few tips to make it successful and easy, of course, always position, position, position. So turn the head with enough posterior space, may need to pump the scapula up or place the patient in a lateral position, elevate the head of the bed. Uh, very important, especially an obese patient. Also, it, it, you, don't, you don't get that uh, engorged uh, external jugular uh, vein in your way. Um, arm should be completely adducted to the side and avoid external jugular vein, which is, you know, common sense. If the identification of the underlying anatomy is difficult, then ultrasound with concomitant nerve 
simulation can be used. And what we are looking for here is basically a deltoid or biceps muscle contraction. The spread of the local anesthetic just outside the fascia of the plexus and on one side of the nerve root is sufficient for blockade, although its duration may be inferior to uh, circumferential and intraplexus spread. I will show you more pictures so things make sense. So here we are at level of uh, uh, C6. Notice the position of the patient and the probe. Notice the, the cut section here. So that's how we position it. Now, in case we want to place a catheter, um, it's direct, uh, the way we do it, direct the needle through the prevertebral fascia to the level uh, of the C5, uh, C6 nerve root with the tip of the needle or the catheter remaining lateral to and outside the fascia of the plexus, following the injection of local anesthetic to open up the space and verify its appropriate spread, the needle should be maintained in its position while a catheter is inserted up to one to two centimeter in this plane. And I will show you a few pictures here. Now, in terms of peripheral nerve simulator, there are a um, few studies, uh, one uh, randomized clinical trial here, with um, you know around 10, 15 patients, there is another uh, description here that there is a promising use of peripheral nerve simulator for acute post-surgical uh, uh, pain. So complication, uh, uh, of course, vascular injury, uh, namely the vertebral and uh, carotid artery, ipsilateral phrenic nerve paralysis, uh, and this is almost up to 100 person. So caution in patient with lung disease, it can manifest as mild dyspnea and lead to decreases in the measures of pulmonary function up to 30% of the forest vital capacity. Horner syndrome can happen, I showed you why, and usually present with epsilateral ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and nasal congestion. Hoarseness also can happen because of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, I showed you why, and local anesthetic systematic dis toxicity. So notice, especially for these two, these are um, mainly when people used to use a very large volume for this uh, block. Now, absolute contraindication will be patient refusal, local infection, allergy to local anesthetic, contralateral pneumonectomy or pneumothorax for obvious reasons, contralateral paresis, of the phrenic or recurrent laryngeal nerve and contralateral interscaling block. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. The first way is to scan medial to lateral, starting from the cricoid cartilage level, uh, which is, as I said, roughly uh, C6. So you start uh, uh, here. So that's very close. You can see the trachea here. You can uh, see the thyroid, the common uh, uh, carotid, and then you move uh, uh, lateral and, of course, posterior, and you start to see the anterior scalene muscle here until you see the anterior scalene and middle scalene and the plexus uh, between them. So that's one way. This, the other way is to trace back from the supraclavicular fossa approach. So starting down here at B, this is a classic supraclavicular picture with the first strip here. And then you uh, trace it up. Now you start to see the uh, superior trunk here. And now you start to see the C5 and C6 between anterior and middle scaling. So the C5, C6, and sometimes C7 usually give you what they call it the traffic light appearance. You know, the traffic light appearance at usually around C7 or uh, C6. And it's important to familiarize yourself with how these uh, 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 cervical vertebrae look like. So the C7 root, not visible in this view, uh, forms the middle trunk of the Brachial plexus, of course, the transverse process of the C5 and C6 
have anterior and posterior tubercle. See anterior and posterior, anterior and posterior. While the transverse process of C7 has only posterior tubercle. That's that's the, the posterior tubercle of uh, C7. So that's important landmark to differentiate between them and know where you are when you start scanning. Um, medial to C7 root at the level of the transverse process, the vertebral artery can be identified. So you see the vertebral artery here, then the vertebral artery here, then vertebral artery here. Very important to visualize to avoid basically injuring that artery. And here is another vertebral artery uh, visualized with the Doppler. Now, here another uh, image, you see the C5 and C6 together. You see the C7 here. Here is the dorsus capillary nerve, the lung thoracic nerve uh, here. And you see uh, here, specifically, I want you to see the phrenic nerve, how close it is. Now, it's important to keep in mind that there is some variation in course of nerve root C5 and C6. Uh, indeed, it's about 40% of uh, people might have that variation with how they course through the anterior and middle scalene, as you see in this picture. So this is a live video doing an interscalene uh, precaplexus block. Uh, and this is C5, this is 6, this is 7. So notice um, um, older, you know, uh, references used to go in between them to make sure you inject in both sides of the plexus. Now, this turned out that it can be dangerous because you can uh, injure the, the sheath, uh, either mechanical injury or even chemical injury. Uh, and even if you put the medication on this side, then you maybe withdraw and go here. You can better spread without going through the plexus. And 10 to 15 ml tend to be enough. So just quickly how we place a catheter. So basically, um, it's, you know, up to your preference if you are doing it by yourself or you have an assistant. So here, notice the, the, the needle placed. Then the procedure is holding the syringe in the right hand. And here, uh, 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 simultaneous needle insertion and injection with one hand, just to hydrodissect if you wish. And once you are happy here with visualization of the ultrasound uh, and the local spread, confirm that, then you uh, take the, the, the catheter and uh, you take, sorry, the, the syringe and you place the catheter. It's like a cylinder technique here. You are pushing it inside. Then you take the sheath or the introducer. Again, different companies, but similar concept. Then uh, you confirm with ultrasound the proper uh, positioning and Put your filter here and inject, make sure you have a good spread. After that, you can tunnel it. And there are a few ways to do that. But this is a simple way. You are taking an 18 gauge uh, needle from the kit. And you are going from here to the um, same or close by, uh, you know, uh, entry. Uh, obviously, you don't need to puncture the catheter. And then you tunnel the catheter inside that from here to here. So here it's tunneled, as you see. And then you start to tapening and, and, and put the dressing and the fixation. Now, this is the catheter under ultrasound. So in this specific case, uh, the tip is pointing to uh, C7. It passed uh, 5 and 6. Uh, and unless if it's a multi-orifice catheter, then that can be a problematic here because you're only spreading medication to C5, of course, unless if you are using a higher volume. But if it's a multi-orifice, then you can, even with a lower volume, you can spread better the medication. Maybe I will pull it back like this uh, and, and make sure I have uh, a good spread with a, with a catheter. 
Now, what's the, what's the deal with the superior trunk breaker plexus block? So it's a newer block, if you wish, and it's an injection at the superior trunk just before the suprascapular nerve emerge. So it's at, at the trunk level and before the superior, supraclavicular nerve emerge from the superior trunk. Um, and the potential advantage, obviously, is to avoid the phrenic nerve block and avoid, uh, and, and, the, and, and of course, that can also avoid the dorsal scapular and lung thoracic nerve injury, uh, which I will show you in a second. So again, to remind you, this is where is the, the, the phrenic nerve when we are at the level of the superior trunk, it start to go away, right? So there is a recent uh, beta analysis that pulled data from four randomized clinical trial, including patient undergoing shoulder arthroscopy, that shows that superior trunk block was found to have equivalent analgesic efficacy compared with interscalene block. I'll bet with a superior safety profile in terms of respiratory outcomes. And I hope by now you understand why. So indication like interscaling, shoulder and proximal arm, however, for shoulder is crucial to make sure you block the suprascapular nerve. And I showed you that and we'll, we'll go over it uh, uh, again. And sometimes also uh, you need to supplement the supraclavicular, which I will also show you. So position like the interscaling, start scanning from the supraclavicular fossa and move up until you see these trunks. And of course, go up and down just to confirm. Um, the block should be performed proximal to the takeoff of the suprascapular nerve, which I will show you how you find it now. And you need to supplement with a supraclavicular Block. Remember, that's a continuous, inner, continuous innervation for the area I showed you in a previous slide. And you can do that by two ways. The easiest way and more convenient here is to inject over the middle scaling muscle on your way out, and then you will block mainly the intermediate supraclavicular nerve. Or you can back up and slightly go up in a level and go inject posterior to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and you will get more branches. It's important and crucial in this block to identify the transverse cervical and dorsoscapular arteries using color dopra to prevent inadvertent injury and, and of course, uh, intravascular injection. When you place a catheter, uh, you can aim to the posterior inferior corner of the superior trunk if the, cath if the catheter tip, it's important, if the catheter tip passed deep, then it may miss the suprascapular nerve, especially with the lower volume infusion. As always, the tip of the needle catheter should remain lateral and outside the fascia of the plexus. Now, there are no, so far, by the time I'm, pre I'm preparing this lecture, there is no reported uh, uh, case report for peripheral nerve stimulator. Potential complication, obviously the incidence of the phrenic nerve palsy following the superior trunk is about 5% compared with about 70% after uh, uh, there is, this is a, um, uh, one of the first, and I think the first randomized clinical trial that was published in anesthesiology a few years ago, comparing between the interscaling and superior trunk. And they use the same volume and the same injected, and, and you see how big the, the difference in the incidence. And I will show you how they exactly did their technique, so you hopefully get similar result. And of course, one of the complications, and this is why I, I told you, you should uh, find the transverse cervical artery and dorsal scapular artery. Uh, rarely will be, you know, pneumothorax, uh, uh, Horner syndrome, recurrent laryngeal, etc. And of course, uh, last still can happen. So here, the superior trunk is basically, as you remember, it's like C5 and C6 coming together. Um, and here, if you pay attention, usually the uh, 
suprascapular nerve is lateral and very close at this level. Uh, will uh, will be obvious with the next uh, coming images. Now, remember, you need to see pre-procedure, identify the transverse cervical artery to avoid injuring it. If you don't use Doppler, if you don't know that it exists there, or you don't pay attention, you easily can go through that artery, and you can imagine what will happen. Now, just to remind you, the branches of the supraclavicular nerve, they are above, between the midiscalene and the sternocleidomastoid. So here, uh, also, you get the superior trunk and you get the middle trunk, which is basically C7. And you see here the numbing medication spreading out. Now, if you notice here the relationship of the suprascapular nerve to the superior trunk. It's always lateral and superficial structure. Lateral and superficial, lateral and superficial, lateral and superficial. Okay? So this is how you do it. And this is the technique that was described by original uh, paper. So you're going, you're placing the tip posterior inferior to the trunk and inject about 10 mil and you see the, the spread, very nice spread. Then after you do that, you withdraw and you redirect anterior and superior and you inject 5 ml. And you will see um, how is the, the spread and where is the uh, suprascapular nerve, uh, which I will show you in a minute here. You make sure you have a good spread, and that's you get the suprascapular nerve. Okay, so supraclavicular brachial plexus block. It's an injection at the division of the brachial plexus immediately separated to the clavicle, distal trunk, and proximal division. This is where we do it, right? And the supraclavicular fossa is bordered inferiorly by the clavicle medially by the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid and superiorly by the omohyoid. Now, in this picture here, you notice how the, uh, uh, the superior trunk, so the superior, uh, lateral and superficial to the subclavian artery is the superior trunk composed, uh, sorry, superior trunk is here, uh, composed of C5 and C6. Now, in the corner pocket, I jumped into that, you get the inferior trunk, and that's a continuation of C5 and T1. In the middle, around here, you get the middle trunk, which is a continuation of C5, right? And this is a classic area of coverage of the supraclavicular uh, uh, block. So what's missing here is the intercostal brachial nerve, which is not a big deal. You need it, uh, you know, mainly for the tourniquet, etc. So you just infiltrate some local anesthetic here, like 5 to 10 ml subcutaneous, and you can also do it with ultrasound. So this block, the supraclavicular brachial plexus block, is ideal for surgical procedure on the arm, elbow, forearm, and hand. It may work for the shoulder if you supplement it with the suprascapular nerve, plus minus dorsoscapular, maybe not a big deal, and plus minus the supraclavicular branches, as I showed you. Now, again, position, position, position is the key. Turn the head, uh, place the patient supine, elevate the head, uh, arm should be completely adducted to the side. Make sure you visualize the first trip. Remember the first slide I showed you? This is your friend. This is your friend for safety and to avoid injuring the lung. Uh, it's better to start at the corner pocket to anesthetize the inferior trunk and elevate the plexus away give you more uh, uh, area here to work. And the component of the brachial plexus at the supraclavicular level can sometimes be separated by a blood visit. Again, make sure you can get a dorsoscapular artery here or a, bran uh, or a branch of the, another uh, thoracocervical branch from the subclavian artery or the transverse cervical artery. 
Um, so it's very important to identify them with Doppler and know where they are before you place your needle. Now, this is how you position your patient and your ultrasound, see the orientation of the probe of the needle. And when you want to place a catheter, you can insert it again from lateral to medial, uh, go to the corner pocket, follow the injection of local anesthetic to open up the subfacial space and verify its appearance spread. Then the needle should be maintained in its position while the catheter is inserted up to approximately one to two centimeter into this perineural space. Uh, peripheral nerve stimulator, there are few reported cases with different uh, stimulator companies in the chronic pain world, mainly for neuropathic uh, pain and uh, plexus plex injury. Uh, complication, transient ipsilateral phrenic nerve, uh, it still can occur, but obviously lower than um, the interscaling. Uh, and it's a good habit just to always visualize that phrenic nerve. Bradycardia and hypotension can occur and it was thought that um, it's secondary to basal jarish reflex, um, and that can occur up to 24% uh, of, of uh, patient. Uh, subclavian artery injury and injection, pneumothorax very rare, Horner syndrome also very rare, with the kind, especially if you don't use that uh, uh, unnecessarily high volume. And of course, you can get last. Now, here is a, a precar plexus. Uh, circled to you at the supraclavicular uh, level, like here. And you see the supraclavicular nerve at, at this level. Uh, it's just underneath the omohyoid. And I have a lecture, by the way, of the supraclavicular nerve, how it curves and how you capture it. So it's a good way to capture it here as well. So you bring your needle, you go to the corner pocket, you inject there about 10 cc, and you redirect and you inject there. So this is your superior trunk, this is your middle trunk, and this is your inferior trunk. Um, here is an important image showing you how, uh, where is the dorsal scapular artery? Again, uh, if you don't pay attention to that, if you don't adjust your uh, approach, you can go through that. Here is a, a short clip for you. And going, uh, always avoid uh, touching the plexus. You go to the corner pocket, you inject, you lift up that plexus. And then once you, you put maybe 10 cc there, that corner pocket, as you see, you lift it up. Then you redirect and you can go above. So usually 20 ml, no more than 30 ml, usually more than enough for this block. Right? And this is where you put the catheter, remember? Okay, infraclavicular preclal plexus block. So it's, uh, it's an injection at the cords of the preclal plexus below the clavicle. So we are talking about the cord. This is where we're supposed to cover. And this is your coverage area. Again, you are missing the intercostal brachial nerve, which I, I explained to you how you can get that. And this is uh, good for procedure at or below the elbow because it's a phrenic sparing uh, block. Again, tips, position, position, position. And you, uh, and, and this is also important. So uh, you need to keep the pectoralis minor muscle in the screen. I will show you why in a second. And eventually you are looking for a U-shape spread underneath the axillary artery. You may use the curvilinear transducer occasionally for better visualization, especially of morbidly obese patient. So that's uh, ideally how you uh, place the patient, the probe, and your needle. So speaking of needle, we have three uh, uh, reported approaches. You have the coracoid approach, the coracoid approach, of course, infraclavicular coracoid approach, which is my favorite, I think, you know, and most of us, you, we like to do that. You can do also retroclavicular approach here at number two, and you can do costoclavicular approach, which is more uh, proximal, right? For catheter, um, when you, you were planning to place the catheter, um, so you need to place the tip, uh, the posterior aspect of the artery. That's the six o'clock. Um, 
uh, when you after you do the double uh, bubble uh, uh, sign uh, and it's recommended of course always to put some local to open up uh, that space and sometimes if you want to use stimulating catheter you know that's a common mistake if you use saline you're not going to get a good stimulation for the conduction purposes so use five percent dextrose to open up that space so you can get some stimulation and make sure you're happy where, where you are placing it now uh, of course there is reportedly le less risk of catheter dislodgement compared to supraclavicular block this is why um, many of us like to do this approach for catheters for peripheral nerve simulator there is also some reported cases in the chronic pain ward uh, and and usually you can place it uh, at the lateral cord or the posterior cord for complication uh, axillary artery and veer injury that's the most common reported pneumothorax um, you know should be extremely rare especially if you go lateral enough uh, ipsilateral phrenic nerve extremely rare but not impossible and last so that's your uh, image you have the pectoralis major and minor uh, uh, underneath that and you see visualize the axillary artery and you see the cord scattered around the artery so here it's very important where you place your probe and what's the position of the arm for the patient is it adducted or abducted so if it's adducted and you are slightly more medial it turns out you can get them all in one side of the axillary artery okay so if you see that that means you are either you need to reposition the arm which we most of us prefer to do with this in adducted arm position so when you do it in adducted arm and you make sure you see the uh, 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 pectoralis minor in the view which attached to the coracoid process so around here and then you see the lateral cord the posterior cord the medial cord that's what the view that we would like to to see right and another important thing to keep in mind that there is a, a facial sheath around the neurovascular bundle so expect uh, a couple of um, you know uh, pops in in your way so there is usually a facial uh, septum that separate the lateral cord from the posterior and medial cord you need to pierce that septum to achieve that u-shape uh, 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 classic spread now um, there are again a uh, few ways to do it but the, the the vertical infraclavicular plexus approach uh, you insert the needle here where is the the blue circle immediately inferior to the clavicle at this point while the coracoid approach you insert it here at the red circle it's about two centimeter medial and inferior to the coracoid process so here you should see the pectoralis minor in the view this is the most commonly uh, performed uh, approach and this is my personal recommended approach uh, the green line here indicate the interscaling groove just for imagination where is that uh, plexus uh, going now in this images um, here uh, in in A you see the the, the arrow indicates the the tip of the needle uh, around starting at uh, L uh, uh, lateral cord then it start to go on on B here with some injection pointing to the posterior cord now we are at six o'clock and we start the injection here and now here. You, you see the classic u-shaped spread here is a small clip for you so again hydrodissecting never never go through the plexus you don't want to have an injury um, um, you know I, in very rarely I see in my clinic um, some injuries related to uh, infraclavicular plexus uh, block and catheter placement so once you open up that you keep chasing that you just go under the artery and you see the nice classic u-shaped spread 
And usually 20 ml to 30 ml maximum can, can do the trick. Okay, finally, let's uh, wrap up this lecture with the axillary uh, precal plexus block. So this is an injection at individual level of branches, uh, namely radial, ulnar, median, and musculocutaneous nerve of the precal plexus, right? So that's the kind of spread you get, and that uh, this is why it's, it's, it's recommended for procedure at or below the elbow, but if you're going to use it for elbow, then you need to think about how you're going to cover the, the make sure you, you, you the intercostal precal also for the tourniquet, right? So tips, again, position. Now, this is the only one I would abduct the arm uh, 90 degree and keep the... Uh, Keep, uh, keep in mind there is some anatomical variability I will show you in a minute. And of course, avoid injury to the vessels. And uh, you need to see the, the conjoint tendon. If you don't see it, that means you are too distal in the arm. So what's important is the anatomical variation. So that's the you know, classic finding. You have the musculocutaneous branch outside the sheath in the coracobrachialis muscle. And the median nerve at 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock, ulnar nerve, 5 o'clock radial. But still, in about you know, 30, 35%, you don't always get that same uh, distribution. You can get them all inside the sheath, sometimes merging together. I will show you a picture in a second. And, 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 and sometimes in different location. So it's not a commonly used catheter, and I don't recommend it. It will uh, probably dislodge there. Also, peripheral nerve simulator was not reported, and I don't recommend it. I think it's a higher risk of infection if you place it there, and you don't need to, honestly. Um, complication, axillary artery vein injury last. This is how you position your patient, position your ultrasound probe. This is how uh, your, your needle earth insertion. So here, <clears throat> you see the conjoint tendon there. That's usually, it's a, that means you are in a good level here. And in this specific picture, you see the musculocutaneous nerve where? And then that's the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. So that's usually superior anterior. And this is superior posterior. And this is the radial nerve deep to the artery. Here is another picture to show you that the musculocutaneous is in a slightly different uh, location. And usually you go first to that corner, uh, you know, um, uh, inject around the radial nerve. Then you go and inject above the artery. If you have a circumferential spread around the artery, that will give you a good coverage. And then in your way out, you can inject the musculocutaneous nerve. Some people use it the other way around. It's your personal preference. Now here, uh, what's very important in this image, what I want you to see, so this is the median nerve. This is the ulnar nerve very close to it, the radial nerve. They looks like as one structure. And here is the musculocutaneous nerve. What's important here, you see this is the axillary artery, but see how much visits we have. This is all visits. See how vascular it is. So you need to pay attention there. Um, Sometimes some pressure can obliterate these veins, but pay attention to this uh, vein right there. So this is a short clip. Again, in this approach, uh, the procedure is the provider preferred to do the musculocutaneous first, then went to uh, inject uh, under the axillary artery and then above the axillary artery, eventually going above, as you see, make sure you're not going through the vein and you see the nice spread all over the artery. And usually 25 to 30 ml is more than enough. So finally, um, you know, we talk about peripheral nerve simulator, but keep an eye on my prickle plexopathy lecture where I'm going to go in depth and talk about all this peripheral nerve simulator, where you place it and how you do it. These are my references and extra references, and thank you for watching. I hope this is helpful.